Welcome back to another episode. You know what? Why don't you introduce us? Why don't you introduce the show? You want to do that? You, you feel up to it? Yes, that will be great. So hi everyone, I'm Aisley Krobler. I'm a South African uh, astronomer and engineer. And thank you, Robbie, for having me on the show. It's great to be on Out of the Blank again, where we will answer the questions basically out of the blank. What do you have questions of? Like when it comes to anything, like, I mean, you've, you're, you're an astronomer. So, I mean, when it comes to just anything out there in space, you know, I, I think everyone has the UFO thing on their mind. And I know we've talked about it on our last episode, but man, once you threw that space civilization things in the class periods of like civilization uh, one and then civilization two, and then kind of this whole, I don't know, I've been thinking completely different after that now, because the idea of space travel for so long was thought of like just an impossible goal until we did it and then colonizing on a planet does not seem that far off anymore i was thinking 50 years but i think it might be sooner than that i'll be a lot sooner so last week i don't know if you followed the inspiration four mission from elon musk spacex Mm -mm. that was last week launched the first ever civilian crew that went up in space so none of the crew members had any as formal astronaut training. None of them are scientists or engineers. They are private citizens that want to go up in space for a specific cause to help um, promote medical research. But it is a great opportunity and this is where things is heading. And Elon Musk also dropped a trailer of SpaceX that he envisions the what the future will be like. And he envisions, like, if you go out in the street, you want to go somewhere, you pull yourself an Uber, you jump into a taxi. The same thing, you will have the opportunity to travel between different planets and different places in our solar system. There is, are, are they going to be doing like a, a extensive background check? Like, I mean, there's common cases of Uber drivers being attacked and being like, I could I don't I don't want anybody who's mentally unstable, but I don't know what you classify as mentally unstable to be on an aircraft. I probably would shouldn't even be on a spacecraft going up into outer space. You tell me the earth's not flat, I'm gonna lose my marbles. <laughs> so probably yes. So probably they on it are gonna be a few checks and balances, but that is where we are currently heading. And I see NASA has uh, provided a proposal where different companies can submit a proposal and a new proposal is for a new lunar lander that they want ready by 2024 to land on the moon again. And I see the two companies, well, two my guy that's competing for this uh, contract from NASA is SpaceX and Blue Origin of Jeff Bezos. Yeah, Mr. Bezos, I saw his tweet where he uh, congratulated Elon Musk. I thought it was weird that Biden didn't say anything about that. It seems like he seems to be probably one of our presidents that doesn't seem that interested in the whole space thing, which is like it's refreshing because I think that's always been on everybody's like the, the final frontier of space. It's kind of been on everybody's mind. And I, I'm more interested in obviously in the oceans and some things at Earth, because I think Earth the reason why religions are so powerful is because there's just unexplainable stuff that the earth has about it that we haven't scientifically been able to really discover yet, which is what people just chalk up to like, oh, it's a God thing. It's a religion thing. And I don't think it's that, but I mean, I also wanted to discover the anomalies that we have on this planet before we go up into space or we start colonizing other planets. But man, it's just not that uh, appealing to a lot of people is really looking deeper into the earth when there's so much more out there to left to discover. And I mean, you're telling me there's an infinite universe and then an infinite galaxy. And then there's a galaxy upon another galaxy and another galaxy. And then as much as far as we know, there's just endless possibilities, man, I would like to test to see where those ends are, if we can find them. And if we are going to be able to find them, I think the capacity for human life, basically when we start colonizing on another planet is going to change. I think our definition of aging, um, like how back in the day, there were people that lived to be in their thirties. Now we're living to be close to a hundred. I think that's going to only go even farther when we start colonizing on other planets, we're going to start discovering something a little bit, probably unlocking something about ourselves. 
That's actually very true. And that's actually a very good point you're making, especially about our age for we as humans to be able to live longer. So everywhere around the world, retirement age is mostly accepted at around 65 years old. But that came from PS statistics. So when you go back about to the mid 2000s to 2010, then the average age a person got was 64, 65. Now where we are now, the average age is now sitting at around about 78, 80. And statistics show that in the next 10 years, the average age a person will get is around about 110 and 115. So our quality of life is improving. So by doing research, by doing scientific research, by investing in new technologies, that dribbles through. And one of the technologies being developed is how do we actually prolong our life? So something interesting I came across and it's also investigating, and I see there's a handful of companies that does this, is cryogenic freezing. So when you have a terminal condition, yet they gradually freeze you. And when the technology is invented to treat that problem, then they unfreeze you, treat you, and continue on with your life. This kind of freaks me out because I'm starting to get images into my head of um, different scientific studies that are going to be start being concluded when we find out that now we know about our atmosphere. We know about certain like, you know, uh, grow some sustainable life because of how close we are to the sun. Now, if you're able to go to another planet, when are you going to start being able to find case studies where people are going to be able to fix dementia or fix Alzheimer's on the basis of gravity, on the basis of maybe different physical properties that another planet has? I mean, these are things that are capable for the future. I mean, for instance, like uh, you're not in Alaska, but there's a northern lights behind you on screen. So with to say that there isn't a planet that you might not be able to feel those right now, but imagine you get to another planet where the atmosphere is a little bit, a, a different change in it, where you're able to feel something like that. Do you think that would have properties when it comes to the basis of evolution of like people? It could be. So who's to say on a different planet, there's a natural resource that we have no knowledge about and that resource, we can use that to treat certain illnesses, to treat certain conditions. A good example is of the Star Trek movie, Star Trek Insurrection, where they are on a planet and there's rings around that planet and there's particles emanating from those rings that stop the Enterprise crew and all the people in from planet to age. So that is something that might happen out of space. We don't know, but it's something, it'll be really cool to see something like that. Yeah, I just because I start to wonder what happens if there's a planet where maybe time moves a little bit. I mean, time probably moves the same on the relative, I guess. On, I, I guess I don't know, because don't we base time off the sun? Like time is a construct of man. And we base that off the sun. So if you're on a different planet, would you age the same or would you age differently? That might be a dumb question. You would age differently. So time and space are interleaved. So you can. So that's why we speak about the space time continuum. And usually when you do the math, the heavier an object is, then it, I want to say, dilutes time a little bit. So there's a few experiments here on Earth that has been done. So one of the things is in time, the faster you move through space, the slower time becomes. So when you have two atomic clocks, you put one on the ground, you put one in a high altitude aircraft, and you fly that aircraft around Earth and you land again, then you will see there's a slight difference in time that started to happen, even though these two clocks are identical. And that is in physics what we call the time dilation. And that is some, a weird paradox if you think about it. Do you think that it's possible that if you go onto another planet, like if you decide like eventually when we colonize on another planet, do you think that it would just be easier instead of cryogenically freezing somebody to be able to maybe wait until we can find maybe medical science is caught up to the point where you can cure whatever disease they have, but a more effective way would possibly letting that person still live just on a planet where time moves slower? That can also happen. So a good example of that is in the movie Interstellar. Mm -hmm. where they visited the planet and then a couple of hours on the planet is a couple of days 
on Earth. It was an hour was seven years. Oh, seven years. Yes, you are correct. Yeah. And it all depends on how fast that planet is moving through space and what the mass of that planet is. But yes, that is some weird stuff that we have in time dilation. Because I see that as more of an effective way. I mean, if you would have said Walt Disney has his frozen head locked in like a cryogenic basement, people lost their freaking minds. But if you say that a person, instead of being cryogenically frozen, that I feel like a lot of people would not want, maybe put them on a different planet where time moves slower is seen as a better way. Like letting someone who's on their deathbed live out the rest of their days even longer on a planet where the time moves a little bit differently. That is very true. And since the last time we spoke, I've, I've thought about it. Have you ever heard about the Fermi paradox? I've heard of it. So the Fermi paradox in essence is we are here on Earth and the universe is extremely big and it is expanding and becoming bigger. So that leaves us with a question, are we alone in the universe or not? So the Fermi paradox has two scenarios on this. The first one is there are a lot of other alien civilizations, but they haven't made contact with us yet. And then it raises the question of why not? Perhaps we are not interesting enough to those civilizations. Perhaps the universe is so big that we can't reach one another. And then the second part of the Fermi paradox is there's no other life out there. The only life in the universe is us here on Earth. And that is a more scarier thought than why would we, we be alone on Earth? So it's either one of two. Either there's a lot of alien civilizations or we are alone in a universe. And that is called the Fermi paradox. When I heard about this um, recently brought to my attention was like a electric phenomenon, which is how people describe the three lights in the sky. For the mm -hmm. longest time, I thought it was if it was aliens, maybe they conquered two dimensional space, which is just being able to flatten yourself into a two dimensional form it takes up less space. I mean, we could do that with objects here. The earth would probably be uh, you'd have a thousand times more space. You wouldn't have the need for yes. skyscrapers because skyscrapers are only built because everything around your area is already filled up. So the only way you can build is upwards. I wonder though, because if that is a phenomenon that the earth is just naturally doing that we just don't have an explanation for, which is what a lot of scientists have said, that's what it mm -hmm. could possibly be. It seems like you're, they pick or patter or they're trying to find a definitive conclusion on something. And I feel like with a lot of things, we just don't have the technology to have a definitive conclusion on, but it's that, that little thing with like, oh, it's the unknown, or I have to be able to find something to make it known, or I have to be give it a label or something. That little human need is what ends up getting, I don't know, misinterpreted, where eventually five, 10 years from now, we end up redoing it over again, saying actually it wasn't that, it was something else. And I, I like I said before about the whole space travel thing on our last episode being like 50 years, 100 years, man, I, 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 with all this stuff going on, I don't know if it's going to be 50 years, but I start to look at what evolutionary changes are we going to start seeing when people start inhabiting another planet. Now, if you took me and someone who's spent their whole entire life and their family was all from Egypt, they, their body would be used to those conditions more to the sun or desert climates need less water probably sweat less than an area where if i went over there i would be sweating and i would be thirsty all the time and i would need i wouldn't be able to handle the climate and that's like um i have a i think it's your background that's going to remind this story for me but when i was in eighth grade a kid moved to our school and he was wearing shorts and like a short sleeve shirt in the middle of winter everyone's wearing big ass jackets and we're like what the hell aren't you cold he goes dude i'm hot I'm like what do you mean you're hot he goes i'm from alaska I'm like, and uh, yeah. that's where the kind of click in my brain went, where I started realizing that like, wherever you're from, whatever, you know, I'm in a beach town. So I'm constantly like a little bit cold if it's like in its seventies, because I'm always used to it being super hot, mm -hmm. that climate shift, even if it's a small amount of time, you're telling me that eventually if you have someone that lives on Mars, or if you have someone that lives on Neptune or another thing, their body is going to naturally change. And I wonder when that transgression really takes hold we have astronauts that'll spend a year in space and then when they come down they have to be in a chamber because they can get the bends or their body has to adjust for the gravity gravity now that they're not being adjusted to 
So that is actually what's happening on the International Space Station. So one thing that happens if you are up there for a couple of weeks, you will actually become a inch or two taller. <laughs> because um, if you look at your back, your there's little cushions between the bones in your back. Yes. And especially in your spinal cord. So when you're in space, you have no gravity compressing your spinal cord. So now in space, your spinal cord can relax and can set out a little bit. So while in space, you're actually one or two inches longer. And one thing else that happens in space is you lose bone density. Because here on Earth, you have gravity. We constantly need to pick up something. And if we let it go, it drops. But in space, if you leave something, you just floats around. So these astronauts have to do specific exercises and have specific supplements to make sure they don't lose bone density. And if they are in space for a long while, say for a three to six month mission or six month to a year mission, coming back to Earth, it's a little bit of rehabilitation you need to go through because now your body is used to not being without gravity and now you're on Earth and you have gravity again. And the same thing will happen, for example, with the colony on Mars, because if we look at Mars, Mars has two thirds of gravity. So if we have a colony on Earth, uh, on Mars, somewhere in the future, when you spend a lot of time there, you will also lose a little bit of bone density, you will lose a bit of mass density. And that is something that we need to compensate for. But coming back to what you said, what the next thing in evolution was, I've read up um, recently something really cool. If we look at human advancements, the last uh, human, the, all the most human advancements happened in the last hundred years. So going from where everybody used a horse and carriage to where a car was first created and used, that was a couple of thousand years. But going to where the Wright brothers flew the first airplane to where the first person, Neil Armstrong, walked on the moon is only something like a 60-year difference. Yeah. See, because I'm still thinking on the concept of, like, if we look at, like, um, colonizing on another planet, what about the deal of like the unsigned agreement that if you do spend maybe five years or a couple of years onto another planet, there's not a possibility for you to be able to come back without it killing you. Like I think Neil deGrasse Tyson was the one who mentioned the movie, the boy from Mars, which was a boy yes. that was born on Mars. And then he eventually died when he came to earth because his bones were only used to the planet that he was born on. He only knew Mars's gravity. Now, is that concept going to be true or would eventually instead of having a house on another planet, you'd have to only have like a vacation home. Like you can spend a couple weeks up there, but we can't have you up there forever. Or you're literally going to sign an agreement, an unspoken one that you're not going to be able to return to earth because your body couldn't handle it. If we have generations born on other planets, they're not going to be able to have the same concept of being able to handle earth's gravitational pull or any of its features that it, a lot of us are already used to, because we've had generations upon generations to understand it. That is true, and you're right. That is something Neil deGrasse Tyson has spoken about. So it all depends on, yes, it could be an unspoken rule. If you stay there for a long time, you won't be able to come back. But then it also depends on how technology will develop. So say, for example, you build a house on Mars. What's not to stop you to creating an artificial gravity inside your home on Mars that's equivalent to the gravity here on Earth? Oh, shit, yeah, I didn't even think of that. I don't know. I don't, I don't have that much faith in, I don't think we're at that Star Trek level yet. I mean, we don't even have those little phaser guns that they had in the, in the show, yes. but um, I, I, I see this. Doesn't it blow your mind a little bit when you start like, cause I know you're probably into UFO Twitter probably as much as a lot of people are that are just enjoying space. It's good entertainment. I think there's some good sources in there too, but there's also like a lot of like crazy stuff that does happen when it comes to the alien topic. And I think that's just because it's so unexplainable. There's a lot of people that know their shit when it comes to aliens mm -hmm. or anything like that. But when you see these like random videos of Bob Lazar or all these things from like way back in the day, they look like they were filmed like in like a college class or something like that, like back when he was in his twenties or thirties, does it not come up to your mind that maybe you don't have all the information? Like a lot of the world probably doesn't have a lot of the information, like something's being kind of gatekeeped from you. 
Yes, um, that can be it. So it all comes down to the principle of how the public would react to something. So for example, we spoke about the, in the previous chat we had, if we now discover there's alien life out there, or let's say, for example, last night, an alien ship landed somewhere and the government is now keeping it quiet. By releasing that information, what will it do to the general public? Will it cause mass panic? Will everybody say, yay, finally we know there's aliens? Um, will it change our way of seeing things? Will it change civilizations? So this, that becomes more than a philosophical and ethical question. Yeah, the, the question of if it's ethical, to, I think some people should have the information known to them if they want to know, and just they have to understand the ramifications of what that could in here, which is your perspective or re, your reality being kind of destroyed in a way. But I mean, maybe who's to say we haven't been contacted before, but like, didn't we send a signal out into outer space to hopefully get some type of like, you know, something back, hopefully like a message out there to the stars that just randomly got shot off into space. Who's to yes, say they're, they, who's to say they might not be communicating to us through a different frequency that we haven't been able to understand yet, you know? That could be. So in a message of um, correct, it was sent out from the Arecibo radio telescope that unfortunately collapsed. But in that message, it basically said where yeah, we are, where we are located, and a bit of information about ourselves, like a quick introduction. So with the idea is that we will get one back sometime. But one thing I can tell you that's quite interesting from being on a ground level, scientists and engineers like exchanging ideas and like to exchange knowledge and whatever they discovered or figured out. Between scientists and engineers, there is no problem. For example, if a scientist now contacts me from anywhere around the world, I will share research, that scientist will share research. The problem is it starts becoming a political problem because then government's political figure says, oh, but we cannot give information to that guy unless we get something back in return. And that is where the bugger up comes in. Do you think that it would be more possible that when we start opening up their true capabilities of space travel and actually being able to colonize that this whole space idea of aliens and all this would just be lumped under a freedom of Inf information act type thing, or it would be like a human so. ethical error to hide any information when it comes to artificial intelligence, when it comes to unidentified aerial phenomenon, any of these things. Cause right now it seems like it's a topic for sure that should be known to a lot of people if they want to know it, but it's still mandated very, very heavily about the information that does get released to you. So I'm wondering when it actually figure, when we actually figure out that we have more capabilities than what's just on this planet that we can go and start doing other planets, how long until that is a freedom and a well-known source of information information for the public to actually consume rather than something that's handpicked like a bunch of scavengers just went over it and took out all the good bits and pieces and just give you the excess. That is actually a very good point. Some point in the future that will need to happen. And the only way I see this happening is if a lot of nations start working more closely together. And it's starting to happen all around the world. Take, for example, this pandemic we are now in. A lot of companies, uh, Pfizer and Johnson Johnson, developing vaccines. And these vaccines are spread across the globe. Uh, a lot of more companies are also now developing vaccines. This company here in South Africa that has now a contract with Johnson Johnson to manufacture their vaccine as well. So this is, it's a slow process, but eventually it will happen. Yeah, but I, I, I'm, I'm wondering what that spark is going to be to ignite that. The only reason I think Johnson & Johnson is doing okay in South Africa is because they've had a large rejection from the United States over here after that mishap that they had in Baltimore. You know, there's always something yeah. where it ends up getting switched over into the next hands, all because they're, being, they're not getting popularity and where they're supposed to gain popularity. And I don't want that to happen with space, for instance. Like, I don't want a bunch of people to drop that. Like, a lot of people have dropped off on the alien topic, and there's still some very interested people mm -hmm. that still do documentaries and still talk about it. But it's still in the realms of, like, they're chalking it up to spiritual phenomenon now. By calling it a UAP, you're giving it an umbrella term to mm -hmm. – 
put in the same category as paranormal or cryptids or all this, which is a whole different category in its own because there's actually now more information on aliens or unidentified aerial phenomena than spiritual things or some types of cryptids, for instance. There's just way more information in this category. And I think we have a United Nations. I think at one point it's going to be a united kind of world global thing where it's going to be more than just earth it's going to be the moon it's going to be mars i'm just wondering they're going to have to adapt to the characteristics of that planet not only on the physical elements of what a person's body can endure but also how do they discover their own decisions on how they should run their planet it's going to be uniquely different the same terms for earth aren't going to work for the moon aren't going to work for surprisingly nobody wants to live on the moon i think that would be fucking sweet but everyone's like no it's it's a, it's a rock it's like so is everything but it's apparently really small and it's everyone looks at it like well it's a moon it's not a planet i'm like eh. i mean Do you really care how big your front yard is? There are people in New York that don't have a front yard. Like I'm just, I'm over here like questioning like why people don't eat. That's the closest one to us. It's not a planet, but it's an idea of just getting off the earth and then being able to sustain life or have a suitable home on something that isn't earth. That's true. That's something because I know NASA is trying to aim to put a lander on the moon in 2024, yeah, perhaps a little bit later, depending on what happens. But that's going to be the first step, is to put the first uh, another person back on the moon to show we have the technology to still be able to go to the moon. Then a second phase would be like the research base there in Antarctica, is to put a research center or research base up on the moon. Then from there on, as soon as there's first foothold on the moon in the forms of a research base, research center, then entrepreneurs will start investigating it. Can we put a hotel on the moon? Can we make it a vacation hotspot for the rich? Then from there, as soon as we cut the technology becomes more available and more cheaper, then people will start visiting it even more. And then eventually it will become a colony on the moon. Then from the moon, it will be much easier to go out to other places in space. Who do you think the first uh, gateway or first wave of people that are going to be the ones colonizing on another planet are going to be? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like maybe entrepreneurs, but like Bezos types, but maybe even the royal family, because I know we all talk about like rich people, for instance, like Bezos is probably the world's richest in the sense of popularity rich. But when it comes to the royal family has they have money that they don't even need to talk about. That's how rich they are. So I look at that as being an avenue of some first or second wave people that are going to start colonizing on another planet. I mean, they have skyscrapers and they don't need to have them. You know, they have no area around them that's inhabited. They just live in a desert or something, but they will like the appealing aspects of having a skyscraper and they have the money to do so. I think one uh, royal family rents $5 million a week, one of Bill Gates's yachts. And I'm like, you're not even owning it. You're renting it for $5 million. Now, I saw um, apparently Jeff Bezos, um, you can chart the easy yacht for around about $4 million. I don't... But that's true. So, but for the first set of humans that will colonize somewhere in space, will probably, the first set will probably have skill sets required to set up a civilization. So that will be engineers, will be doctors, it will be scientists, just to get everything up and running. And then from there on, you can send uh, the next level of what we need. Do we, then we will need stuff for entertainment. We will need economists. We will need entrepreneurs. And then eventually, then we will have that society will be developed that we can be cross travel between the two different worlds. And then society can go on as normal. What do you think the giant push for space travel or space kind of colonization in the past year or two seems to have ramped up like a hundred times? I don't think it's the capability that now we just have discovered the technology to do so. Do you think that's a warning of maybe something's coming this way? Like everyone talks about like a solar flare or everybody talks about something about the planet's not going to last much longer, which I think the planet's going to last way longer than anybody on this planet is going to be alive for. But a reset you think people are fearing that reset that everyone talks about yellowstone whatever it could be well earth is going to outlast us humans in any case 
So I think the idea is that we have a backup plan. So for the human species to survive, that we spread our wings and travel across our own solar system and galaxy and then eventually the universe. Um, take for Earth, for example, if a big meteor hits a part of Earth, you can wipe out a city, you can wipe out a continent. So at least there will be humans somewhere else on the planet that survives. But now if we have a big events, for example, that killed all the dinosaurs. And how do we survive as a human species? So we need to find these ways to survive. But in the last year, the factor driving everything comes down to two things. A bit of an ego, who is going to be the first person or first company or first organization on Mars. And then the second thing is, how can you make money out of it? I would think that the main, like, I know uh, I saw Elon tweet something and a lot of people don't like Elon. I'm a fan. Um, I'm also a big fan. I know. Yeah. I know a few people that's against Elon Musk, um, but I'm a big fan. I know more than a few people that are against Elon, but I'm, I'm just a fan of his attitude, man. Um, he changed his Twitter handle to name, just name. It's not Elon Musk anymore. It was just name with a check mark. And I know that just pissed people off because there are people out there have been trying to get check mark for so long. But he's that type of guy. But I read his documentary where it kind of shows a different side of why he got thrown into his work. And he's not really he's not an evil type. He's just a person that cares about making his life easier and better. And if anything kind of happens in the way of it, which is like, okay, people start getting electric cars because he wanted an electric car, then that's going to happen. And then people think he's like making decisions for everyone. I was like, no, he's a guy that just wants to make his life easier. And yes. I wonder if anybody's thinking about the capabilities of being able to create something like a program like Armageddon where we can stop asteroids from hitting this planet. You know, we can do certain things like that. We haven't had any asteroids hit in a long time, but we've had <clears throat> under the radar, probably like, mm, that did not taste good. Um, probably a good amount of like Jupiter, for instance, I think it's Jupiter or is it some Mercury? One of those is a giant like shield for our planet. Yes, that's Jupiter. Okay, so Jupiter has blocked a lot of asteroids that you end up looking up like how many asteroids are about to hit Earth. There was quite a few, and there were in recent times too. Like I think the last one I read was 2018, around the time of Halloween was one that was going to like it was huge. That was like the size of Australia that was mm -hmm. gonna hit. And I'm like, well, is anybody thinking of technology to be able to prevent these things from happening this way? Like instead of a planet relying on a planet to do these types of things, because I think for so long the reason we're alive today without anything like that happening is definitely luck. And I'm wondering when we can take it out of the thing of just, let's just hope it doesn't happen to where we can put it into our own hands. And I know a lot of people would have maybe an issue with that when it comes to a concept of like, you're playing God or whatever, but the concept of being able to protect life from some type of outside event, which is where my mind also starts leading into, if we start colonizing on another planet, how long until we end up going to a different planet, to a different planet, to a different planet, and eventually some type of chain reaction happens where we might create something like a black hole or we might create something out of just particles or whatever influence that we had out there that wasn't naturally there that might cause a chain reaction and eventually end up maybe making a second big bang. That is really true, but uh, one of my colleagues attended a conference last year where they are actually investigating what to do if a giant asteroid is heading towards Earth. And what people don't realize is there's a lot of space junk orbiting Earth. So when satellites reach the end of their life, they usually deorbited and they burn up in the atmosphere or they are pushed into deep space. But there's been so many vehicle launches into space that there's a whole lot of space junk just floating around. And if one of those pieces of space junk, its orbit becomes not stable and it re-enters, you can possibly wipe out the city with that. So there's now research and progress being done to see how can we defend ourselves from space junk and also in asteroids. And one of the leading theories is, or proposed projects is, to have a giant laser, but not to blow it into pieces, but if you have your object and you have your laser and you have just a laser 
push it a little bit, if you just move it a couple of inches and um, while it's approaching Earth, that couple of inches will transform into a couple of miles while the angle changes and that will cause it to eat Earth, uh, miss Earth completely. Kind of like uh, if you blew on a balloon, you just lightly give it a and then it just flies away in the opposite direction. Yes. When you blew it. Okay. Um, do you think that it's a possibility that if all these satellites and everything, because I know we talked about on your very first time on, I'm bringing it back mm -hmm. that far, that uh, we talked about like all the space junk makes it kind of hard for astronomers to do their job because, you know, you do have to sort through a lot of that stuff there as well, too. And then mm -hmm. the air pollution doesn't really help, too. But what about like for all these alien experiences or people seeing giant flying metal objects in the sky, do you think a lot of this could be burned up satellites or satellites that, cause once you go up into, even if you're an astronaut that was up into space for a month or maybe a couple of minutes and you come back down, I still think that there's something now different about your cellular structure. Now that you've discovered mm -hmm. something that you've never discovered before. I mean, we know what air is like, we know what all this is like, but it's like a kid smoking his very first cigarette. His body's not going to ever be the same ever again. No matter if he stops smoking right after that first cigarette, your cells now understand what this information of a cigarette is. What about going up into space, this technology somehow becomes warped in a way we don't understand. So when it does burn up, maybe a lot of these things have a little bit of their cells might be a little bit out of whack because, I mean, they're still material. Materials hold cells where there's a possibility where there could be these rare occurrences where it's trying to enter the our gravity or something happens. And this could explain some of these UFO or unidentified aerial phenomenon occurrences. That could be. And something interesting happened here in South Africa about three weeks ago. So right in the northern parts of South Africa, a lot of people reported they have seen a streak of light going across the sky just, I think, after 6 p.m. one evening. And people were freaking out. Is it an asteroid coming in? Is it something that exploded? Is the government busy with a top secret mission or what's happening? And what actually happened is the Chinese launched a rocket and something happened to the first stage. So the first stage is not like Elon the way they can land it and reuse it. They just burn it up in the atmosphere. And something happened with their re-entry and it actually didn't burn up over ocean, it burned up over Africa. And a lot of people saw it and that freaked out a lot of people. Wasn't there a giant like rocket or some type of comet that came recently? Like I think it was over over around winter time there was a some type or beginning of january i think there was a giant like videos i was seeing of people like in california looking at this giant comet thing with this long yes. tail what, what was that so that is a comet that entered our solar system and it actually came close to earth but um if you think about the moon is roughly 250 million miles away so at that comet moved just behind the moon. So it missed Earth, but became extremely close to Earth. But one thing that happened is we didn't saw or detect the comet coming towards us. And the reason for that is it came out of the direction of the sun. So it was, when we detected it, it was, well, where the hell did this come from? But luckily, as uh, I know news outlets will say, oh, it's as close as the moon to us, but 250 million miles, that's still far away. So yeah. something I feel, it's, so that's all far away. So it missed us, but it caused, caused quite spectacular images in the sky. Yeah, I know. Um, I think uh, even with like, uh, you hear a lot of accounts of like rockets and, or not rockets, but um, like a kind of like shooting stars or types of weird phenomenon that happen from Alaska, mostly Alaska. And mm -hmm. I think that's also because the light pollution, you can kind of see it more too. But I think all these things that people talk about, like it's aliens, it's aliens. I'm like, I think this has naturally been happening for a very long time, that there's always comets and there's always these things that you could see in the night sky. But sadly, we've just gotten so used to not seeing it. I mean, we basically turned out the most beautiful thing in the world. People want to go to the Grand Canyon to see something that is like will make you gawk or make you just like, ah. <gasps> 
but I mean, we had that naturally just by looking up into the sky and we're seeing a lot more now. Like I think every single year I'm seeing less and less stars, whether that's burnout from stars or whether that's just because the pollution in our sky is kind of causing us to not really see those. Can you imagine being there when, if you would have known that was happening, like just to have light in your own home or light up the dark on this planet that we live in, you're sacrificing the biggest light of all which is the light up in the sky yes so unfortunately that is the trade-off so we invent new technology but only later we discover oh but now it's causing pollution and you can't see the stars but one thing i've also realized i don't know how the situation in the u.s is but i see it more here in south africa and that's continuing becoming worse is science ignorant people that is they don't listen to science um, don't listen to explanations. They just form their own opinion and run off to it. So the one thing is you will have a scientist working for years and years and years on a study and then publishes the work and then some random guy on YouTube will say it's bullshit. Yeah, it's weird how the shift in YouTube, when I get an astrophysics person or an astronomer, or whoever, anybody that could study space on this podcast, it'll get less views than someone that'll get a flat earther on their podcast. But I think a lot of it, it's a lot of people trying to prove that flat earther wrong, but the sad part is you're giving them views and that causes it to be more known, which causes more mm. views for the people to see that rather than the actual science. And I just think this is why it's important for people that create YouTube videos and make their own science related content. Um, it just sucks that there's a lot of people that are not willing to be open to new ideas about things as well, too. Like as much as I entertain the conspiracy stuff, too, I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't entertain the science stuff. I think that's kind of like the most important thing is just having a discussion about things. And it seems like what's on the chopping block now is always science. Um, science, everyone. I know there's a giant push for like science is trust the science, trust the science. I'm like, yeah, but. The reason why a lot of people feel like you can't trust the science is because science has been wrong so many times, but they're not thinking in the perspective of science is always constantly changing because it's always trying to find a better information, better source, and being able to try and classify something to help understand something that is unexplainable in ways. And I think that's why it's just very weird because then you start reading accounts of like Avi Loeb, who talked about that long pencil shaped, mm -hmm. not really a comet, but this thing that seemed like it was from a lost civilization. There were 80 something other astronomers and people that study astrophysics that were calling Avi Loeb just a liar, a conspiracy person mm -hmm. and completely discrediting his work when he couldn't in turn be right. But it was a factor of they were publishing papers that maybe they spent 20, 15, 10 years on. And he was about to discredit all of that just by making this thing it's kind of like a game system not like an xbox but like a winning and losing style game somebody wants to get their name remembered in history somebody would like to get something named after them somebody wants to get their name recorded somewhere or win a nobel prize or something like that if you look at the methods of how these are obtained a lot of them most of the time are 100 percent just hard work and effort put into it. But a lot of it too is a lot of slandering on another person's work in fear that it would take discredit your own. And this is where the competition style, we see the same thing with our court systems. When it's a lawyer representing a client, it doesn't matter if he knows they're guilty. It's He's got a job to do and it's win, win. It doesn't matter what the truth is. And I think that's a lot of what happens with how we end up getting all this backlash on science and history and all these things is because the real 100% truth of a lot of things are not being told because of a factor. There are things trying to stop them or there are factors of things trying to make sure that this is clouded by something. There's information being taken out whenever there's documents that are established to us by whatever report the government mm -hmm. deems is worthy. I get you have to whatever out, outline the names of the things that of people that would it, it would infringe upon them for but you're also not lending that era or that hand for trust for people to want to understand and listen to what you have to say because you want to retract every single thing that you've ever said on a piece of paper but leave only a couple small little things in there that doesn't really help out anything that is very true and i think also a big contributing factor is if we go back 30 years to the 90s if you want to publish some information you have to go to some sort of a news outlet some sort of newspaper radio station tv station 
But now we have a lot of more technology accessible to publish information. We have the internet. You can set up your own blog. You can set up a website. You can set up your own podcast. You can create a YouTube channel. You can create your own streaming service with a show. So I think it's now easier for information to get out there. And a lot of this information or being out there is not regulated anymore. Yeah, the the shift between, you know, if you were going to put up two options of listening to a scientist talk about some type of discovery on another planet compared to, actually, I'll give you a great example. When the rover hit Mars, when that first thing happened, that was that was trending. It was a video you could watch on Twitter, but you know what was ahead of that? Was that freaking little Nas video. The one where he got banned because he was dry humping Satan. There were trending articles like that that were above the Mars thing. Like I even was talking to people. I was like, did you know that we just landed on Mars like the rover did? And everyone's like, oh, that was today, wasn't it? I was like, nobody gave a shit. Nobody cared about that compared to if you look at when we first landed on the moon allegedly um but when that video came out there was everyone was dancing in the street and really glued to whatever screen or whatever the hell that they were getting their information from newspapers whatever they were excited but then this time there wasn't that excitement and i'm like this comes from a factor of what is in the public's eye nowadays is not the important stuff that maybe you or me would see as important i think information is valid in any type of way but Unless you're like, I'm not a fan. Like I'm a fan of Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I'm not a fan with how he like can just shuck sh- like stuff off his shoulder so quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he, if I was going to mention a face to science, most people would say Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I think he has a lot of power and a lot of movements in the things that he says. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Elon Musk. He doesn't want the power, but he has it. And mm-hmm. I think these are people that have a more of a responsibility for what they say, which is where I look at Neil deGrasse Tyson for saying, I don't think it's aliens. I don't think it's this. I'm not hurt. I'm understanding that he has a giant role to play as a major figurehead for science. Anybody that wants to interview somebody for something about space or science is Neil deGrasse Tyson, the first person that pops up into their mind. So he's not only thinking of future generations or people that are going to be examining his work, but he's also thinking about the capabilities of keeping this number one position when it comes to space talk or anything of that sort. And I think it's very, very hard when I watch um, these people on Joe Rogan or something, because he much like myself wants to bring out these questions. And I get it. If you're an academic, you don't want to uphold your career. You don't want to ruin anything that might tarnish it by going into some crazy podcast and answering some crazy questions. But I think it's also a sense of, You're going to open yourself up not only to the idea that your education system might think differently upon you, but you're going to open yourself up to the public. I think this is what it's important about having academics like you, for Mm -hmm. instance, coming onto my show. You're a good friend, but at the same time, you're more understanding how people consume content now. I think this idea of what your institution thinks is not really important compared to the basic function of just what the world would think. More people want to hear from people like yourself or more people want to hear from other people involved in these fields, but not in the whole professional way anymore. I could we could be sit here and be professional all day, but it's more fun when you start skeptic when you start skeptically thinking or talking about these types of colonizations on these planets, which aren't that far off anymore. And I think that's important to have because especially with institutions, for instance, you're gonna discern or you're gonna discredit somebody because you don't want to do the thing because it might infect your institution. How sensitive are jobs now? How sensitive is life now? You should just be trying your best to be able to do the thing that you want to be able to do, which which I think is highly important. I think that's why there's a lot of people that have issues with the way we view content. Content now is watching a reaction video or a Minecraft gamer do some type of thing where he makes $60,000 by sitting on his ass for five minutes. But what about the educational ones? What about the stuff where you're actually going to receive some information or maybe get a thought provoking thought in your head when a lot of those people that's not the content that's being viewed because there's not really anybody that's willing to just be open about things that they think or skepticize that's why my whole thing is conversation this does not reflect your institution doesn't ref- reflect your job it reflects what comes into your head when you think about stuff if you don't have 100 facts that's okay the whole point is that we're going to talk about these things and 
think. That is what I like about your show is just talking about these issues. Um, you can form your own opinions on it, but most importantly for people watching and listening to the show is just to have a little light bulb going and say, oh, but that's something I didn't know, or that's something interesting, or perhaps this is something I can investigate, but that is an interesting opinion. That is an interesting fact. And that is why I love the show. Um, you always learn something new and you always figure something out and you also always have something a different perspective to look at things. It doesn't help anyone just looking through, looking at it's my perspective, it's the only way something's going to happen. It helps looking at different perspectives, seeing it through somebody else's eyes and say, ah, oh, okay, but that makes more sense in that way. I think this leads to a bigger point that I was trying to get to was that I just picture a bunch of people sitting in a boardroom whenever we have something scientific or we have anything that's on the cusp of being discovered or released. And there's a bunch of people that just agree rather than people just throwing in a random thought on the optics of how they might look to the other people around them. You know, there's a lot of job ending careers that stories that we've probably heard of. of so, oh, he said this and then he lost his job. But why though? Like I, I, I I get if I get if it's against society standards, like somebody says something they shouldn't say. But what about just throwing out a random idea where someone looks at me, like, what the fuck did you just say? Like that's important stuff to have in there because now you're you're on alert. You're questioning now. Now you're thinking a little bit more. I just picture these boardrooms. Someone just throws a thing of papers on the desk and goes, "So this is how this is going to go. Everyone, all right with this? Raise your hand. I." And then they all raise their hands and it's mm -hmm. over with. Where's the kind of like back and forth discussion? It doesn't need to be an argument that hinders the progress or growth of whatever you're going towards, mm -hmm. but a more of understanding of, did we think of everything? Like when back in the day when they wanted to launch a nuke at the moon and everyone's there, everyone's like, yeah, let's do it. We'll show how powerful we are to Russia. And then one dude, one man, whoever walked into the room and just goes, yeah, but if we do that, any type of colonizing on another planet or any type of maybe research we could get out of discovering the atmosphere or anything that will be ruined because you just did this. This will completely change everything from here on out when that hits. And then everyone's like, I didn't think of that. That's important stuff that needs to be classified in one of these discussions or in one of these talks. I think that's the point of having scientific articles or types of things online because you'll be reading through the comments. For every third person that tells you to go kill yourself, you'll find one guy out there that's fucking throws in a perspective you've never even thought of. Oh, yes. And that is actually very important. And that's one thing about the scientific community. Everyone that attends a scientific conference will realize it's not a bunch of people sitting there listen, listening to a presentation, clapping hands at the end, saying, okay, well done. No, after a presentation, oh, how it usually breaks loose for people starting to debate whatever was presented now. And the same thing, if you publish a scientific peer-reviewed article, you will get backlash. Some people will agree with you. Some other people won't agree with you. And then you will find out some other research institute that said, okay, you said this, we're going to try and duplicate it and see if we can get the same conclusion as you. So usually there's a lot of debate going on in the scientific world on certain issues. We need more devil's advocates. I think we have a bunch of people that say we agree and disagree. I want more people just to be a devil's advocate. If you agree with someone, still bring up the points of like, what about this? What about this? That's the weirdest thing about like when you watch some of these scientific conference, they usually turn into debates. I think debates are fun and important, but I also mm -hmm. think there's a better way to get the point across because even if you prove that person wrong, they're not going to change their mind. They're going to actually be more pissed off and try and going to want to do it their way and shut down your response or maybe your thought because you are attacking them with such hostility. That is also some of the issues coming in. And it all depends on your, I think, your interperson relations. Some people are totally sensitive to certain things. Some people absolutely don't give a damn mm -hmm. of what happens. So that's where the human factor comes in. And I actually just thought about it earlier with this new mention what will happen to your DNA, for example, going to a different world or a different planet or outer space. NASA actually did an experiment on it. So as a couple of years ago, they there's a series on Netflix about it, One Year in Space. That's where they NASA had two identical twin brothers that's both astronauts. One was sent up to the International Space Station for a year, and one was kept here on Earth for a year. And then afterwards, both of their DNA were 
<laughs> next to each other and examine to see if something changed. And then that's where the field epigenetics comes in. Where epigenetics say small factors in your environment can change your DNA. And from this, it was determined that one brother's DNA is now completely different to the other brother's DNA. Do you think that would eventually have like a side effect to future generations being born from that DNA that has been altered? Definitely. Like, would that cause fertility issues? It could, but I want to say fertility issues. I think that will cause other problems. So, say for example, um, if you now are born on Mars, you'll be born with less muscle density, less bone density. So that's a few issues that will pop up in the future, perhaps. Or your body will now be evolved and becoming more adapt to living into space, for example. Could it possibly mess you up, like mentally? Like that lady Lisa Nowak, I think her name was. You know, remember her? Yes. She was the NASA astronaut that drove like 900 miles to go beat up that lady that was sleeping with her fiance yeah. or something. Yeah. To say that that lady didn't have, like Buzz Aldrin, for instance, that man said there was water on the moon moon and an obelisk on Mars. They found water on the moon, and now they have these pictures where people are like, what is this? And there's a little metal like thing that was zoomed in and enhanced on Mars. I'm like, all right, I'm not discrediting that guy anymore, because that. but I think NASA needs to vet their astronauts. But I'm wondering if there's like some type of like how football, they're starting to discover that people are having CTE at younger and younger ages from all the head trauma. Is there a possibility that this type of thing could cellular, cellularly mess you up? I had to say that one really slow. <laughs> but... I, that could mess you up or alter something where eventually maybe 20 years down the line, you start having some major type of symptoms, or maybe you might live longer. Buzz Aldrin's like 80 something. Isn't he? He's old as shit and he's still alive. I'm like, look, man, I'm just saying maybe he might have an extra bit of like age to him now that he's been up in space, even for a brief amount of time, something alters your cells do not realign hundred percent back together. That could be, it could be that something alters you, but on a more funnier note, I'm actually thinking now, I don't know if you ever saw the video of uh, Buzz Aldrin that punched a guy that told him that. Yeah, he, yeah, oh. yes. <laughs> I'm trying to look, he's 91. The man's 91 years old. You're telling me that he doesn't have some, and he does, ah, he looks horrible. But I'm saying <laughs> it, that to say that he's not altered a little bit, from just being out there, I mean, if he was, if he's 91 right now, that means he had to be born in 1930. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people, my great grandfather was born in 1930. He did not, I mean, he lived to be in his nineties. Sure. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm just looking at it like, Hey man, maybe there's a slight factor that he might be altered in such a way that he's throwing punches. Yeah. So I'm just saying, maybe there might be something on there. Maybe the more time you spend in space, the longer you get to live a little bit. Maybe some of these astronauts. That yeah. That could be, but more on a psychological level, the astronaut Colonel Chris Hartfield, he said every person went up to space and have seen the Earth from outer space completely now has a different perspective of Earth. What do you mean by different perspective of Earth? So see, see, instead of seeing Earth as different countries, you start now seeing Earth as a whole and seeing the beauty of Earth that needs to be protected and environment needs to be protected. And more precisely, everybody on Earth that starts to need to be working together. So he said everyone that's been in space has this life-changing moment around them. Do you think that once we understand space travel a little bit better to the point where we can colonize on other planets, that it would just be more simple to get a lot of people to start understanding that it's more of a whole rather than just in parts by having them see space and see the planet from up a space view rather than just seeing photos and videos of it. Cause there's something about a photo and a video that doesn't have the impact that a 
video or not a video, um, uh, actual first person eyesight perspective can give you, you know, going up into space and looking and seeing the earth is one thing compared to seeing a video of somebody looking at the earth. You're not going to get the same impact out of it. Maybe the president should start taking a space travel maybe that should be a requirement to see that he's got more to protect than just what he sees in front of him it's now something even bigger than that it's now instead of a bunch of different countries that are on one planet it's now one planet that's all connected in together even if they are separate countries it's all one yes and i completely agree with you as more people are seeing uh, get into a mindset of we are one human species a different country isn't a different species on its own with its own population as a different species. We are one species and our species needs to start working together. Maybe one day. Maybe I think that comes with space travel, though. If you start saying that you can go colonize on other planets, people are going to do whatever they possibly can to get off this one to be able to colonize on the other one. But my fear still comes into the factor of how long until we start having terrorists or people that are going to be on other planets that just go crazy, man. I think there's a whole thing that we're skipping out on, which is how malleable our brains are to another environment like that. I mean, it's a shock if every day you have to wake up and your gravity is a little bit different than the one you were adjusted to. Eventually, you're going to snap. Even the most mentally sealed, tight, normal people would have some type of snap to them. That's why they do these astronaut training camps where they have a bunch of people sit in a pod for so long so they can be able to understand how each other work and see what mental kind of aggressions they need to address before they actually send you up there to do the real thing. That is actually very true. And there's actually a cool experiment currently happening in the Hawaiian Islands where they have this dome set up to simulate a dome on a different planet where you're living in, then they have volunteers to live in those domes for six months to a year in close proximity to one another to see what a psychological effect will be. And then if there's an issue that pops up between two persons, how would those problems be mitigated? And something interesting that popped up from that research is usually what happens is the astronauts in that dome we usually start being, picking fights with mission control. The astronauts will team together and they will fight with mission control. So what I actually did to solve that problem is every couple of weeks, they would change the mission control crew. Yeah, I think we talked about that last time too. Yeah. I wonder if they could start spraying like a chemical, just have them all like go get all super horny and just fucking <laughs> fly around. And I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be some type of way to be able to like, because I mean, when you start sending things up and like, I, I know uh, there's some old projects where they sent like a dog up into space or they sent something up, a chimp up into space. And they had no plans of trying to save that chimp or whatever that was set up there. It was kind of like a, a one, one go type of thing. There was no situations to scavenge them or get them back. It's kind of decommission it, shut it off. And then whatever happens, it eventually dies. Um, I think there's going to be a way where you can start being able to maybe modify some type of like because they're pumping oxygen into the these space stations and these types of things as well too for them to be able to breathe who's to say there isn't something that can change the type of whatever add something to the air to be able to calm people down you know we have types of incense that i mean most of them piss me off even more than before but people use incense to relax maybe they can use some type of method like that to be able to calm people down when they're living in a colony or in some type of planet it could be, and now there's a lot of research being done on it, and I know there's especially a lot of military research being done on it. For, like, for example, you have now a bunch of rioters, and instead of throwing tear gas at them or flashbangs, you throw a couple of grenades, and it pops out the gas that everybody, all of a sudden, makes everybody calm. So these types of research are being done. Yeah, you said grenades. I was like, oh my god, they're just throwing grenades at people. That's right nearby. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's interesting, man. I think uh, it's definitely a great time to be alive. Um, I do think a lot of more classical innovations were better back in the day. But when it comes to the advancement of technology, I'm just hoping we don't advance so much where we start looking at these things that are a luxury. Our cell phones, for instance, were luxuries at one point. Now they seem more reliant into our everyday life than we might need them to be. Think I've been taking a big push off social media. I just post once and I'm done. If anybody needs to message me, they can message me. I think that's 
important to do because you start to realize how addictive that thing could easily slip into your mind where that's all you think about 24 seven. It's very hard, especially doing a podcast for an hour or so to be able to have it down and not be able to touch it. It's a, it's something where your brain's always like, ah, I want to check something. I want to check something. It might not even be anything there. But that's a luxury that has now become a necessity in a way. And I'm wondering with technology advancing forward, how many things are going to start becoming necessities basically when they're really just luxuries? That's true. I don't know if you remember that triangle of basic human needs. Yeah. Where certain where you have uh, love and food as one, clothes as a different one. Um, there's a new level actually added to that. And now one of the basic needs for humans is the need to have internet. I don't know what you want me to say to that one. We're dead. I don't know. We're all going to, we're, we're a failed civilization. That's what it is. Um, I think it's just, it's, 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 a, it's not unchangeable. I just wonder how long that change and what would need to be taken for people to realize that I think limits on phones are good, but I'm wondering if there's just with this era of necessity that is now reached onto social media and other platforms, games and all that. I'm wondering if that would all be forgotten about. Cause like when you go on vacation, for instance, if you go to Hawaii or if you go out to the beach or something, most of the time you might have your phone to take a couple of pictures, but you're not really on it as much as you usually are when you're just sitting in your home. I'm wondering how long that would be in space before people start reaching for their cell phones and trying to find things to do. For, I don't know about you, but if I was in a place that had no gravity or gravity was a lot less, I'd be jumping around like Superman most of the freaking time. So I don't think I would be on my phone making TikTok videos. And I just, wonder how normal would that eventually become for people that all they have known was that if i personally agree for me as well if i was suddenly in this weightless in space i would have so much fun but i think as soon as the novelty wears off i mean people will create tiktok videos of the hmm. weird stuff they are doing in space that's, that's the that's the last thing I need is to see an astronaut farting in a space costume, whatever, in, a, in that freaking capsule. <laughs> TikTok video lasting ten seconds long, but look, hey, stick, you're giving me enough of your time, man. Where can people find you? Any of your links? So, you know, I'm definitely going to probably have another chat with you again uh, coming oh, yes, down the line. More than welcome. So you can reach me on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find me on the, the handle Hasty Krubber, just my name and surname, or lowercase one word, so H-E-Y-S-T-E-K-G-R-O-B-L-E-R. And I'll make sure I link it on the description. Is there anything you want to say to anybody out there listening before we wrap up the show? Just before we wrap up, um, just coming to think about now is just to keep an open mind to everything and be curious. Try to figure out what makes you tick and what your interests are. So they say curiosity killed the cat, but that couldn't be the only thing that killed it. Yeah. <laughs>